Love is a smoke raised with the fumes of sighs, being purged a fire sparkling in lover's eyes, being vexed a sea nourished with lover's tears. What is it else? A madness most discreet, a choking gall and a pervasive sweet. William Shakespeare. One of my most esteemed professors at university had this way of telling us to enforce, to enforce um, evidence-based medicine. If you can't measure it, don't mention it. So let's start there. All right, so romantic love is an intense attraction involving the desire for union and merger. Idealization of the beloved, concepts of exclusivity, intrusive thinking about the object and you just cannot concentrate. Emotional dependency, there's a type of emotional dependency, and reordering all your hierarchies around your new love. And there's a powerful empathy and concern. So birds do it, bees do it, even educated fleas do it. So let's look at the science of love. I'm Georgie Mercier. Thank you for sharing this day with me. Um, I always like to tell my students, remember that medicine is fun, number one. And number two, knowledge is power. So how does it all begin, this thing that we're all so fascinated in love? Okay. Well, initially you see somebody out there, you're like, oh, that's a hot guy, that's a hot chick. Hmm. So there's obviously something visual. The visual cortex is one of the first things that they inspired. Obviously, though, before um, you had puberty, not so much. So we then can correlate that there has to be something amongst the hormones. So we can relate estrogens and testosterone, the sex hormones, to part of this erotic passion or lust. But then that has to progress, right? I mean, not everybody you think is hot actually progresses to base number one. There has to be something else. So what is it? What changes this erotic passion into love, the love struck phase? Well, there are certain things. We all know about pheromones, fact or fiction. That's the question. So... <clears throat> When we talk about olfaction, there's a different, let me differentiate, there's a difference between olfaction and the pheromone. So we're talking about olfactions as about your smell, your sense of smell. It's the odorants, it's small molecules that bind to this diverse number of receptors and go to your brain and are associated with areas in the brain with memory and um, different feelings. So we all know... Um, if you grew up on the farm and then granny, you were all safe in the kitchen and it's winter outside and they were baking rusks. Every time in your life after that, you smell rusk to take you straight back to that wonderful place. But that's olfaction, it's different. If we're looking at pheromones, it's not necessarily odorants. These are non-volatile, um, larger molecules um, that bind to very specific receptors and elicit a socio-sexual type of response. Very stereotypic, very species-specific, and elicits different responses in male and females. Yes, guys, we're different. The girls and guys story. So it's an ectohormone. They're classified as ectohormones, meaning there are molecules that are secreted, usually armpits and your pubis, by one um, of the uh, of the sexes and are uh, picked up the same species in a different sex and elicits, elicits this type of behavior. Not to be conf uh, confused with odorants, which is slightly different. So do we have scientific proof? Of course. There's always the question. It's one thing talking about the theory of this, but do we have proof? Well, the answer is yes in different animal species. One of the first sort of classified uh, pheromone is bomba coil, which was released by female um, silk moths. And on release of their pheromones will in this elicit a whole range of, social, uh, of sexual behaviors from the male. Also can be seen in Drosophila, quite, um, quite uh, uh, obviously, um, 
CVA, which is uh, secreted by the male Drosophila, which then increases heightened aggression, and the whole initiates the courtship type of behavior between these flies. In mice, we can see quite clearly the difference between the, the sexes, so the sexual dimorphism of these um, type of hormones, where in female mice, they can secrete a, 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 a chemical substance that delays puberty, that prolongs estrus, and decreases testosterone. Strangely enough, the, but the boy's urine has exactly the opposite. Increases the testosterone, increases uterus. Let's get going, girls. Okay. In mammals, they hypothesize or they have identified this um, vomer nasal organ, which is in the nose but on bilateral sides of the nose, and it is often said to be vestigial or non-functioning in humans. Basically, you have your specific pheromone or your proposed pheromone binds to a very specific receptor in this vermonasal organ and will send messages to the brain, specific areas of the brain that are related to an emotional response, sociosexual type of response and patterns. But it never reaches a higher level of consciousness. It secretes, it stimulates the anterior pituitary, an area in your brain, to secrete more FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone. And that's all about producing gametes. It's all about, if you go back, all the way back, of ensuring your offspring and continuation of the species and survival of the fittest. So maybe this is where we get left with this inexplicable impression that we don't really cognize. All right, so we're talking about areas of the brain, which is part of the limbic system. It's about emotion. It's about reward. It's about joy. It's about drug addictions. All right, anterior pituitary will release FSH and LH, um, hormones that are involved in increasing your sexual reproduction. Okay, but... We can say that some odorants can also act as pheromones. I mean, what we can see quite clearly in the animal kingdom, insects are attracted to flowers and different odorants, and they elicit a very sort of stereotype feeding behavior. Aromatherapies, physical, and they're, they're very specific. So perhaps we're being a bit strict on our definition of pheromones, and we could increase it a little bit. So the big hot debate, which is still ongoing, is pheromones in humans, yes or no? Well, it depends on if you're talking to big pharmaceutical companies or not, I suppose. But we're stuck at science, so let's have a look. The first concept of um, pheromones in humans was documented by McClintock in the early 70s, where he documented there's a menstrual synchronicity in females staying together. So somehow they coordinated the menstrual cycles if they survived each other. You have your male hormones, your androgens, which have a lot of, there's been a lot of studies being done, and one can see that there are definite different effects of androgens on the male brain and on the female brain. Different again. Now, I have to pause here, because for the rest of this talk, apart from the science that I'm talking about, you have to sit and pause and wonder about how they pass these experiments on the planning committee. <laughs> so, yes, we're really going to do this. So quite a lot of these experiments involve getting sweaty T-shirts of different men or women and getting others to smell them <laughs> and documenting the responses. So we definitely see a sex-specific patterns of androgens on, different, on the brains. The male and the female brain is different. It has been associated with social, uh, sexual orientation. And girls, yes, guys are stressful. Your levels of cortisone, your stress hormone increases in your saliva when you're around a lot of testosterone. So true story, they're stressful. We have documented proof. Also, higher levels of androgens. So you get the guys to wear their sweaty t-shirts and you give them to a whole bunch of girls and you ask them to sniff them and they say, which of these guys do you think will be the sexiest? And the higher levels of androgens were associated with a higher level of sexual attractiveness. Okay. 
Testosterone also, higher levels of testosterone seem to be linked to an association, quite an old association with a stronger immune system. And remember, we're all programmed to procreate. And if you procreate, you want the strongest offspring with the strongest immune system that will survive all the bad things in the world. Plus, you need a partner to protect you, so he needs to live. So best you have a good immune system. So that's really linked and dominance behaviors. Girls, yes. Your estrogens. Now, can you imagine this bunch of very serious PhD students? Remember, it all comes down to economics. We're cash-strapped and we need an evening out. Let's go and tell the research committee that we need to go to a gentleman's club and go and see how much the lap dancers get tipped according to their, is- their, their menstrual cycle. True story, these guys did that. They got it passed through ethics. They got funding. I mean, if that's not smart, I don't know. And off they went to the gentleman's club and asked all the uh, the dancers, which, I mean, the uh, hypothesis is they're up close and personal, so the gentleman could smell their pheromones or perceive their pheromones because it's not an odorant. Okay? And they documented the number of tips or the amount of tips. It's all quantifiable money if you can't measure it, so they're measuring money. And what they found is there was a distinct increase in tipping of these girls when they were ovulating. So just right then, when they were most fertile, they got the most amount of tips. They did make special mention that they had to wear little things. It wasn't complete nudity. But tampon strings were not visible. It was mentioned in the paper. I'm not kidding you. The tips were lowest, interestingly enough, in the ladies that were menstruating as well as in the ladies that were on an oral contraceptive pill. Now, what the oral contraceptive pill does, it stabilizes your fluctuating hormones so you don't have that progression in the hormones. This was the same. This sort of correlates with the earlier study done in 1983 that ladies who've had their ovaries removed and therefore decrease of their estrogens, their Apparent attractiveness increased when we gave them hormone replacement therapy. So they uh, contributed. There's also this hypothesis um, of copulins, which are a bunch of fatty acids and vaginal fluids, and the composition of which changes according to your menstrual cycle. So these copulins change their composition and are more attractive on a subliminal state when um, the women were ovulating. Guys, there's a song saying, never make a pretty woman your wife. If you think it's just a song, we have science to prove it. (laughs) True story. So men's real world behavior towards women seems very governed by where they are in their menstrual cycle. So the closer they are to ovulating, the more jealous and possessive they are and the more protective behavior they are, unless the women are really beautiful, then they're always protective. Right, this is documented. Again, a fascinating study, which got passed by some ethics committee. We're going to a disco in Vienna, and we're going to talk to the chicks about where they are in their menstrual cycle. They passed that study, and again, it was higher levels of estrogens, and these women were associated with higher perceptions of attractiveness. And here we get in a little bit of a round circle, Because, as we mentioned before, you see a really hot chick or hot dude. They come a little bit closer. You perceive their pheromones. And then it changes what you see. So these higher levels of estrogen and testosterone will actually change the perception of what you see. So the higher levels of estrogen will make you be perceived as having a higher symmetry. Beauty is all about symmetry. Um, it will it will be um, the same about a, a, a low hip um, waist ratio is very important. An increased desirability. All right, and the differences. And now that's okay. We go back to don't make a pretty woman your wife. These um, higher valued mates, as they put it, had a higher tendency to look for partners outside their long term um, partners 
doing estrus. So they get the both, best of both worlds. You see, this is, this is what it helps to be pretty, because you can marry the stable guy that will look after you and all sorts of stuff. Doing estrus, you go out and get the gene pool that will be strong, and you can go back to the stable one. The science, guys, you can't argue with me. All there. All right. These pretty girls are also more prone to be in longer-term relationships and have a higher probability of being poached. Quoting the science. But girls, whatever you do, do not cry. There are chemicals inside tears that decreases your sexual appeal, that decreases sexual arousal and decreases testosterone. Don't go there. All right. So in the beginning, there seems to be a type of a love map. Is there a perfect partner? All right, appearance, absolutely, visual cues, especially for men. They've got this visual cortex that is linked to all sorts of things, visual stimulus, absolutely. They come up to you. All right, pheromones, is it something you um, subconsciously perceive? Does it click in with your immune system? Apparently it's very important. Is there a limbic resonance? So something that puts you together resonates with something they put you together. And is it maybe all guided by hormones? Well, now you're there. You've checked the dude across the, road, the thing. You walked a bit closer. The pheromones are saying, ooh, this is a possibility. What do you do next? You do the eye contact. You look deeply into each other's eyes. And guys, that's not anything weird. That can be quantified. PEA is a chemical that mediates this rapid uh, attraction. It causes a surge of dopamine in the areas of the brain that have got to do with pleasure. Okay. Makes you feel all loved up. It's wonderful. Release of dopamine. Nor adrenaline. Adrenaline is one of your hormones about to fight and flight. You know, you're sweating. You're nervous. Your heart is beating. <gasps> It's very exciting. Very similar in structure to amphetamines. Okay, it is also found in chocolate and strawberries. And we start going to the other food aphrodisiacs, question mark, chilies, oysters, asparagus. So the next thing, you've gazed into each other. So you've got this compatibility of pheromones. You like the look of the person. You're, you have this immune resonance. And the PEA is now pumping that, adrenal, that uh, dopamine into those pleasure centers of your brain. And now you're going to have that kiss, that first kiss. Of course, we're doctors, so we have to like dissect all of that away, and we have a look at the nerves and muscles. Oh, so many muscles, so many nerves around that area. And when you kiss, you stimulate a sensation in your fifth and seventh cranial nerves, and you have a cocktail of drugs released into your brain. Oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline, adrenaline, endorphins. Oh, flooded stuff. And again, the immune system resonance comes up. If you're not compatible with immune systems, you just that kiss just leaves you cold. All right. Again, it increases your sense of smell. So we get back to the odorants, get back to the pheromones, and how it becomes a circle. So let's have a look at it. This falling in love stuff, this cocktail of drugs. We have dopamine. It's evoked by novelty. Everything that's new and fantastic. Okay, it processes, it's involved in processing emotions, pleasure, pain, craving and addictions. Do you get where I'm going with this? Triggers the limbic system, which is about reward. This is good, this is happy, puts you in a happy place. It increases your euphoria, you're euphoric. It increases sociability. I mean, when you're in love, you just love, you love everybody. Everybody loves you. Okay. Serotonin, we all know serotonin is the happy drug. If you're depressed, you take serotonin reuptake inhibitors to increase your serotonin in certain areas of your brain. It is linked to obsessive compulsive disorders. Adrenaline, noradrenaline, your catecholamines, it's about um, your beating heart, the sweaty palms, your dilated pupils. Have you ever noted in Disney movies? The princesses and the lovely people, they've got these dilated pupils. 
It's associated with love, the happy feeling, they're the good people. Whereas the wicked witch has got these tiny pinpoint pupils. You notice that, watch the mood as he moves, it's all there. All right, it's heightened awareness. You can't eat, you can't sleep. Adrenaline, no adrenaline. And if you do a functional MRI, again, you always wonder how you get this patient, you stick them in an MRI tube, their brain lights up exactly like somebody on cocaine, heroin, amphetamines, exactly the same. There is no difference. Hmm. Also, you get endorphins released. Endorphins are your natural morphine-like structures. They make you feel good. Runners, they're the cause of your runner's high and your runner's addiction. You guys all live with runners or are a runner. If they can't run for four days, they're climbing the walls. That is drug withdrawal. Don't tell me any health history. Right. It modulates testosterone, cortisol, FSH, and so it has this whole endocrine response. Right. So there's a song, your love is like a drug, I crash and burn when you leave. Are you surprised? It's actually true. So we're looking at even Shakespeare. Shakespeare knew all about drug addictions, and love is actually a drug. He even spoke about it. Sorrow abides when you depart. Happiness takes its leave. We need to give him drugs. Serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So yes, guys, love is amazing. It is a drug, it's a high. But let me just tell you, all you lovers that think it's going to last forever, I promise to always, like any drug, your receptors get tolerant. You have less and less an effect until it has none. In two or three years, all the evidence of that wonderful cocktail of hormones is gone. Gone. That's why all ideal love stories usually end really early. Can you imagine Juliet going through menopause? <laughs> right, Romeo coping with that. Mm. So guys, there's a transition. Don't worry, it's not all bad news. There's a transition. We have to take over from that heady love thing. There's something. So is there something that creates that transition from that heady, euphoric, romantic state into the stable committed, happy state. Yes, don't worry. We can quantify this. All right. We're talking about oxytocin and vasopressin and some endorphins. Now, this is quite confusing because a lot of you will also know that vasopressin, in medicine, I keep telling my students, we have to be very clever. We can't just have one name for something. We have to have at least two, if not three. So vasopressin is the same as antidiuretic hormone. So you will know it in the context of regulating your body fluids. What makes you thirsty? What makes you drink? Okay. Oxytocin is evoked by nipple and genital stimulation, um, orgasms, kissing, touching. It's the cuddle hormone. It is increased with estrogen, girls. This is why we love cuddling. Guys, just live with it. We've got estrogen. All right. Oxytocin. Okay. It creates a long-term bonding, that social behavior and recognition and increases or decreases the formation of tolerance. So we like it. It keeps us in love longer. All right. Vasopressin is released on very similar type of um, uh, stimulation and has been called a monogamy molecule. We'll look at why later. Endorphins are released and they give you that soothing, safe, I'm so happy type of feeling. Right. Oxytocin. If things go wrong with oxytocin, we find... Roles in autism, schizophrenia, or that depression after you've been jilted. Oxytocin withdrawal, drug withdrawal. Guys, it is also causes a woman to be forgetful. How else do you think you'd get us to marry you? I mean, you have to forget about all the things you do wrong. All right. It decreases her ability to think rationally. I never said that. And it causes that intense attraction or commitment to the man she's with or actually to her newborn baby. It's the same thing on functional MRI, if you, uh, MRI their, their brains. Vasopressin has got a lot to do with jealousy towards a woman and loyalty of a man towards his woman. As you can see, evolutionarily they're quite conserved. They look quite similar in their structures. Vasopressin and oxytocin look quite similar. But the thing is, it's not the presence of these hormones. It is where they act in the brain. 
So girls, would you be able to tell? How would it be a good husband? Will he stay? Will he be true? Well, let me tell you a story how we all came to think about this. Once upon a time, there was a vole. He was a prairie vole. And he had a very, very bad cousin. So this prairie vole, okay, they're made for life. They see the chick. They fall in love. They raise the family. We're all happy and we live happily ever after. All right. Compared to his cousin, the uh, the montane vole, who is not. He's a complete player. He doesn't really care about his wife and his kids at home. He doesn't care. So how do we gain, begin to unravel all of this? Well, they did levels of oxytocin for starters. So they get these little mice in the, 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 the voles and they inject the oxytocin into their brains. And even before they have had a hot steamy session, if you inject oxytocin into that chick's brain, she's in love. That's it. She won't go anywhere. Conversely, if you inject an antagonist, something that blocks that oxytocin, it doesn't matter how many hot steamy scenes they have in the bedroom, she just couldn't care. So oxytocin definitely has a function in this binding. So we can say it's all genetic because it's not the levels of oxytocin as it turns out as to exactly where the oxytocin receptors are. So if we look at medicine and endocrinology, a hormone is a little bit like a lock and key mechanism. Um, you have hormone levels floating all over your body, and it's exposed to all sorts of cells. But unless there is a receptor in those cells, you won't have an action. So your hormone is like a key, and the receptor is a lock. And unless you have a lock, and they fit together perfectly in lock, it, you're not going to have a reaction. So it turns out the most important thing is where... Um, these receptors are located in the brain. So if you do a functional MRI, you can see oxytocin receptors in the nucleus incumbents and females, we'll call this that long-term um, connection, whereas the dopamine-rich areas in the, in, the, um, in the ventral palladium with ADH receptors cause this monogamy of the prairie valve. So it's where the receptors are. If you look at the Montaigne valve, he has, does not have ADH receptors in this area. Again, the ventral palladium has got to do with dopamine rich. And by now you understand that dopamine is about pleasure. It's about that euphoria, reward systems, everything is good. And they lived happily ever after. Not that simple, clearly, because you'll be very pleased to know we cannot measure everything yet. So even though we have the receptors in the right area, there are other influences. So let's look at it. Guys, let's look at from voles to humans. Is there a relation? I mean, it's all very good about the little voles in the prairie and, and, and wherever they are, but what about us? So we also have these oxytocin receptors and these dopamine-rich areas of our brain which um, are involved in reward and motivation. It is now proven, we can prove, guys, on functional MRI, that love is not equal to lust. Different. Both of them are real, but both they are different in different areas of the brain. And you will be pleased to know that romantic passion, because the neurocircuitry has a more powerful influence than lust alone. Right, okay. You can also tell the difference. So guys were lined up and they were showing pictures of their lover and pictures of a friend. So no more really he's just a friend. You can do a functional MRI and you can see. Ooh, uh-uh. Ooh, uh-uh. Not just a friend. And guys, being dumped, it's a withdrawal of all these casualties. When you lose your love, it is really, it is a chronic thing. You are going to lose this whole entire drug addiction that you have. And it's associated with areas of your brain that light up are associated with physical pain. Like really, if you're in pain, the same areas light in real pain. Obsessive compulsive behavior. Mm. The areas that light up when you're wondering what somebody is thinking. I mean, girls on the phone, <laughs> I wonder what he was thinking. Why do you think and how long do we go over and over and over? It shows in your brain. All right, and it even looks like you start loving the rejected or the rejecting partner even more if you look at the brain functional MRI. Problem being, 
that love, lust, and attachments are very separate and can co- can co- happen at the same time. So we get all sorts of complications, jealousy, adultery, divorce. But the good thing is that it's a genetic win. In the end, it's the genetics, the strongest genetics will prevail. So, in the end, guys, we get there. We have the visual attraction, we have the pheromones, we have the PA, we have um, the oxytocin and the whole thing. And now what happens with the big O? Well, an orgasm. We can also quantify that. And again, I get to the place of how did they design these experiments? But they did. All right. So this is an interplay between your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. It's autonomic response, and it's very much in, a, in the balance. You've got to get the balance right to get everything right. Okay. So how they define an explosive discharge of neuromuscular tension at the height of sexual arousal that is usually accompanied by the ejaculation of semen and vaginal contractions. On functional MRI, which they seem to have done at the same time, we have everything lighting up, the amygdala, which is involved in emotions. Again, we have our dopamine-rich areas that light up like a Christmas tree, the cerebellum, which has got to do with involuntary muscle coordinations, pituitary glands with the increase of oxytocin, endorphins, vasopressin. Are you starting to see a pattern here on these hormones? Okay, PET scans show that that orgasms um, do exactly the same things to male and female brains. So there is no difference. Um, Again, it shuts down the areas of behavioral control and the seat of reason. You are no longer rational and in control of your behavior. Documented proof. Okay, It also shuts down the areas involved in anxiety and fear, and it's areas associated with bra- with pain. In other words, you can put somebody in heroin and it looks exactly the same as somebody having an orgasm. And Dr. Kinsey, of course, famously compares it to the sneeze. So what do we know about the physiology of uh, what happens during orgasm? In the end, when you boil it all down, Not terribly much. We do know a couple of things that has got a lot to do with hormonal actions. Um, Most women will have decreased cortisol levels, so having an orgasm actually does decrease your stress levels. Um, Increase is an increase um, in estrogen in response to to these types of stimuli, but not really testosterone. There's an increased correlation with having orgasms in women with an increased uh, testosterone in women. Yes, girls, we also have testosterone, but not really in men. Okay, so it increased, increased testosterone increases the desire in men for a woman. And we know that um, a paired orgasm has a greater response than a single manual, manual orgasm. So there is... There are some benefits to that. But in the end, we don't really know. There's a lot of superimposition of age, education, cultural, religion, and personal things that interplay over this. So now we can measure it. If we look at our definition in the beginning, I read it a lot more, and a little bit now if we pick out certain words, desire, idealization, exclusivity, Intrusive thinking, dependency, reorganizing priorities. I'm just talking drug addiction. All right, so now we can always ask, what are your intentions? And there's a very cynical part of me, and you can Google all these things on on, um, Google, and there is obviously, if there's something to be said about something, there'll be somebody trying to make money out of it. So you can look. From being in love, can I cure love? Okay, maybe block those oxytocin receptors. What about making him or her fall in love? Let's talk about pheromone sprays. A little bit of PEA in that. Mm -hmm. All right, trust. There's some people that try and sell liquid trust as a form of oxytocin. But as I said, you guys all have the power now. You know that it's not oxytocin levels. It is where the receptors are. So there are some people that go as far as saying that maybe we can genetically engineer 
the um, ADH receptor in the correct place. I haven't gone there yet, but anyway. Heartbreak, we feed patients antidepressants. SSRIs are like Smarties. Orgasms, oh, let's not even go there. But there's something for everything on the internet. So, there's a cynical part of me that can say, if you want to marry me, you need to fill in an application. There's a questionnaire and a bunch of tests. So number one, I need a genetic testing to see where your ADH receptors are and if there are enough of them in your ventral palladium. Then I want an MRI with you and you need to look at your ex and I need to know that you're really over her. Then I can check if the au pair walks past, what happens in your brain when the au pair works out. And then, guys... You can always do an F-functional MRI to see if she's really faking her orgasms. So, finally, when you can say, and prove, of course, because everything's about proof in science, that you light up my ventral tegmental areas, my nucleus incumbens, ventral palladian and raphanutria, only then will I say, I love you too. So guys, there are so many things we can measure, but there's still so much unquantifiable, which is such relief. <laughs> but if one wants to be strictly scientific, we can say love is just a whole bunch of chemical states. It's a chemical state which is um, has genetic roots and environmental influences. But may it go on and on. Thank you guys. Are there any questions? <laughs>